Good morning. Outstanding. It feels like we've been here since the morning, so it's a little bit running a little bit late. I'm Shelly Palmer. Thanks, Steffi. Uh, this is Alexander Cottage. Uh, you can't actually pronounce it if you read it, but it's Cottage, I've been told. So we're supposed to talk about the future of mobility, and I don't actually want to talk about the future of mobility. I want to talk about the present of mobility, uh, specifically electronics, uh, in cars, connected cars, electric cars, self-driving cars, semi-driving, self-driving cars, basically cars. Let's talk about cars, Alex. I like to talk about cars, actually. What do you want to know? So cars are going to drive themselves at some point, but right now it's a man-machine partnership between yeah. cars and people, and they are doing amazing things. There's, so I want to talk a little bit about the man-machine partnership and how far it's going to go and how quick and what impact you think that's going to have? Well, let me start like this. Um, probably we have to go back into history and we say something like we do a time warp. And we're going back to the end of the 19th century and I would do something like a poll and you're all back in the 19th century. And I would have asked you right now, like, what is the future of mobility actually looking like? Well, I haven't been there at this time of age, but I, I would have really, my guess would be that probably most of you would probably come up with something the next perfect thing in mobility is something like the best coach ever seen with the nicest carpet in it and driven by 24 horses at a ridiculous speed. Well, then some German engineer came along and invented the, uh, the automobile. And if you were a producer of um, horse-driven coaches, you probably better thought about your business model. Sure. And I think if you do the time warp now back again to the day we are currently in, I think we're at the same stage. So our business model will have to change. For 100 years, we have been building cars. And uh, speaking of BMW, in 2007, we did something like a survey if our strategy is actually still um, the right strategy. And we found out certain things, like the, the population is ever much growing. People are pretty much more living in cities. Yep. The CO2 footprint is, is ever increasing. So it's just more of the same in sense of building cars actually leading us in the right direction. Okay, so um, now I have man-machine partnerships. I mean, look, a car today is one of the few technological things in the world, one of the few tools in the world. The original inventor in America, Henry Ford, who had got the cars on their assembly lines and started to make mass-produced cars, he could come back to life today, get in a car and drive it with almost no remediation whatsoever. There are very few things in the technology world where that's true of the original inventor or the, the first propagator of the technology. So we know the industry hasn't changed pretty much since the 20th century, but we're right on the cusp. So talk to me a little bit about man-machine partnerships and how you would expect that to evolve in the near-term future, because it's about a three-year cycle to get something into a sure. car. So you guys knew three years ago what you were going to bring out now. So tell me what's coming. What's coming? Like, there is always, like, time frames. What's coming, like, in three to four years is actually we have something like self-driving cars on the street. We presented one at the CES in, in early spring. And, uh, what well, the technology is already there. So the thing is, when we actually bring it to the road, the question is, when are our roads and our legislation probably are really ready for having self-driving cars? So explain that to everybody. The, the, the cars are ready, the roads are not. What has to happen? Well, we have to probably have a bigger change. Like, the first thing is, people still want to drive for themselves. And we're a company whose slogan is like the ultimate driving machine. Heard that, yeah. Zero, of course. Um, I think our customers still will be willing to drive the cars for themselves. But we consider, of course, the self-driving artist is the next big thing because it really increases safety. There are always like situations when a self-driving machine can give you really much more self-confidence. Just imagine we've just had the opportunity to drive the 8 and it was really bad traffic out there. Just had an out-of-body, I'm actually still a little aroused by it. I got to sit in a BMW i8, 8i, 8i, i8. 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 First of all, getting into it, it comes with a yoga instructor that boils you up in a little ball, sits your butt in first, and turns you into the car. But once you're in this car, it's like a weird hybrid um, electric car and gasoline engine car with three cylinders? Three cylinders. Three cylinders. So you think a three-cylinder car, that's not going to have much pep. And he threw it at the sport mode, and he said, no, it's a BMW. Trust me, it's a BMW. Go on. But still, if you're driving in traffic, it's probably not the most convenient way to drive for yourself. That's not like the ultimate driving machine. And that's when automated driving really comes into place because you push the button and the car go goes for itself yep. and it's much safer. So or that's adaptive cruise control, right? Yes. Inside, in, inside the urban area. And for the next years, we will see like more features in this sense coming up. 
so if you really talk about the future future and you think about science fiction movies where people are sitting in cars without steering wheels and the thing is completely driven by itself, I think this is more of a distant future. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I'm, I'm really much more interested in this idea of the man-machine partnerships. Now, speaking of the I-8, that had two engines, or two, two, two engines, an electric engine and an uh, internal combustion engine. So you gave me a stat before. I mean, I think I remember it. 76 miles per gallon when it's doing its job? Is that what yes. you're... Yeah. So that's like a lot. Um, supposed to react to that. 76 miles a gallon. Three, 360 nice. horsepower, you have to say that So as that's well. like a lot of horses for a lot of miles. Like my Audi, by comparison, S7 gets about 20 miles a gallon and, and mm. has like a lot more horses to do it. And it doesn't, it's no more fun to drive than this thing. Um, the question I have for you, though, is there's, what I found that was fascinating is this hybrid m model is a strategy. Like Tesla's got an all-electric car, and you've got an all-electric car on the i3. But this car fascinates me because it's sort of a weird combination of phenomenal performance. Uh, you don't have to say that I'll say it because I just drove it. But it's also got this amazing fuel efficiency. And mostly that's been a trade-off. I want a sports car or a car with great performance, or I want to, I want to buy, drive a Chevy Volt. Mm. And this is some other strategy for BMW. Is that, a, uh, obviously, it's clearly something you guys thought a lot about. Tell me a little bit about the two engines, the drivetrain, the transmission between the two seemed seamless to me. I couldn't feel it. So what's the thought process? Is that where we're going? Is, it, is, is hybrid the, the next thing we're going to see at okay. this level? Let's go a little bit deeper because we have two products with mm, the, the BMW i logo on it. And there are different strategies and different really like technologies. So the one that's really an urban car or suburban car, it's the i3. It's a completely electric car. It drives about 80 to 100 miles. And it's perfectly probably for a city like, um, like here in, in New York or if you go to the West Coast, Los Angeles. Because um, you drive it, I don't know how many of you actually commute daily and m who of you is actually driving on a daily range more than 40 miles? Please raise your hand. Okay. More than 40 miles. More than 40 miles Every a day. Every day, one way. I, I'm pretty bad at math, but I think it's um, not, not a low percentage. percentage. Low percentage, yeah. So um, we, we all know the term range anxiety, and 80 miles probably doesn't sound too much for an all electric car. Yeah. But if I tell you that most of the people, and we did really lots of surveys, really are driving less than probably 40 miles a day, and I tell you that these 80 miles are being recharged with a supercharger within 30 minutes, you just go to work, you plug it in, and uh, then you drive it back. And you're completely... Tru tru truly, Alex, though, the, every electric car right now is a lifestyle choice, right? Sure. You, you have a sustainability, uh, personal vision and mission for the world. You feel like you want to help, and so you're going to inconvenience yourself because range anxiety is real. Uh, maybe it's a u the car has a specific use case. It's under 100 miles at a time. You've got to charge it. So I, I get that. But there's no such limitation on the i8. The i8 takes gasoline and it charges itself and you can plug it in a charging station. So this feels like the best of both worlds. I've just never been in a car that was a hybrid that when you stepped on the gas, shot you back the way this thing shot me back. So it's a, it's a totally different experience. So the question is, why didn't we build something like an all-electric super sports car? Or something that went 500 miles a gallon to make the tree huggers super hugging trees. Well, um, that was funny. You're supposed to laugh at that stuff. If you don't do that, <laughs> I'm going to just amuse myself and forget about you guys. Was, go ahead. Just... Now, the thing is like this. Uh, the, the most heavy part uh, in an electric car is the battery. And if you build or try to build something like an electric super sports car, it just gets too heavy. From my point of view, a super sports car and two tons for a vehicle, it just doesn't go together. So what we actually did, we, t we took the smallest battery possibly to really fit into the car and to make it still a hybrid car. You know, the battery in the i8 is basically not for actually electric driving. You can go for it for 20 miles, purely electric driving, but it's more like a boost function. So it is a really comparatively small engine. It's a three-cylinder engine. BMW three-cylinder doesn't seem to fit, but actually it's a three-cylinder engine, but it doesn't sound like a three-cylinder, at no. least. Um, no, it doesn't drive I, I like one either. So. It doesn't drive like one either, no, it's amazing. So it's basically um, a combustion engine driven car by a three-cylinder engine, and the front wheel, uh, the front axle is powered by an electric engine, and it kicks in as a boost. And this gives like this, this insane acceleration, like we have 1 to 60 in 4.4 seconds. Yeah, it's fast. And this is done by the electric engine at the front. So it's not like we wanted to build an, an electric super sports car because it just would get too heavy. If it really has something like but a how does it do in the serious snow? range. Sorry? How does it do in the snow? Just in the snow? 
You're not kidding. Well, we're selling this car in Switzerland as well, and we had something like a snow driving experience. Really? I, I could have brought the movie. Really? Yes, no kidding. It's an, it's an all-wheel drive car. Wow, okay, I stand corrected. I thought you were going to tell me it's a fair weather car, but... Well, I would drive it probably... So let's talk for a second about BMW writ large, all, and, and maybe not as BMW, but as, a, as an automotive giant and a, a luxury car maker. You guys also make industrial vehicles, you make trucks, you do all kinds... I mean, you're a car you company. Do trucks? Yeah. Oh my God, hopefully not. Well, I, wh what do you call the X5? Is that not a truck? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I don't comment on this one. <laughs> I figure I got to poke somewhere, right? <laughs> got to poke somewhere. Is that not a truck? I don't know what to call that. It's not a Beamer. It's a we call it a sports activity vehicle. Oh, yeah. Good. Good Good name. It's a truck. Um, no, but I like that, actually. Sports activity vehicle. I'm going to use that. You know, that's excellent. It's good marketing. So, <laughs> look, there's a sustainability uh, factor that was super important. Gasoline was up six, seven bucks a gallon a couple of years back. Uh, worldwide, it was uh, pushing a four dollar limit here in the States. Everybody was predicting the end of the world and everybody was thinking about s you know, fuel efficiency and how we're going to get it done. Now we're fracking, we've got, we're the number one oil maker, we've got natural gas going, we're, we're sitting here, we're drowning in energy. We com gas is two dollars and sixty cents in Jersey and it's like, or less. Um, who cares about this? Well, um, obviously, many really persons do care about this, even in the United States. And speaking about the X5, we offer the X5 as a plug-in hybrid as well. So the idea is... So I could have an electric truck. Electric truck, <laughs> and a nice one. No, but, but seriously, like, um, we, we try to, to really source from the technology we're getting in the BMW i-Series to really get it into, we call it the Parrot brand, so that the big BMW brand as well. So the technology is coming into other cars as well. Well, as I told you, the new 7 Series, the, the BMW i cars are really made of carbon fiber because the battery is so heavy. We tried to bring in something more lightweight of a material, and we found uh, carbon fiber is half the weight of steel. And of course, we take in this technology and take it to the other cars as well. Probably not in the same kind of, in the kind of way. The i3 is completely made of carbon. We won't produce a completely made of carbon 7 Series, but we take parts, and it's more lightweight than the, the predecessor. So and it's a clever use of technology. It is, actually. So Tesla's thinking all electric. They just came out with a thing called Powerwall. They've become a battery company. They're looking for uh, increased sustainability. They're trying to get us onto solar power. There's, a, there's an electric future. Is that compatible in your mind with the transportation mission? Are we going to have electric transportation that's self-driving? And if so, give me a curve that we're, how I'm going to be able to plot now I've got hybrids, I'm going to go all electric, or I'm going to stay hybrid, and at a certain point I'm going to be, a man, first I'll be semi-autonomous, and then a fully autonomous, sustainable vehicle. Is that a direction, and if it is, when does it happen? Well, we found, uh, I think, a nice marketing word again in our strategy, and it's called iconic change. So what we think what is actually happening is um, we are going through this iconic change, but the whole industry or the way we use mobility won't just change at a snap. So we are offering electric mobility right now, but of course, if you look at the street, it, it's just still a little percentage of really electric-driven cars because we are just at the beginning. And the question is, at what time does it really tip? Yeah. So when does actually more electric cars drive around the street and the combustion engines will go back? Well, unfortunately, my, my crystal ball didn't make it through a custom, but um, I think we are probably still a couple of years away from that. Two? But the thing is, if, as a company, um, you, have to, you have to be able to incorporate in your strategy both ends because if you're only sticking at the old world, more of the right. same, then you probably will be lost. Yeah. Okay. You have to think like, um, you just mentioned the gas price and electricity, and I think it's completely true for the States. I don't know when you last had a chance to be to Beijing. So if you look at China, and China is a quite big country as well, and they have serious environmental problems. If you've ever been to China, um, I always, if I'm um, undressing at night, uh, my, my really... Uh, my, my here, uh, thing is, is black, so they really have seriously environmental problems. And I think the government is thinking about really imposing like legislation things to, to do something about the environmental uh, problems they are having. And just imagine that if China decides with a snap, okay, all cars in five years that are launched on the Chinese market have to be electric, you better be ready as a company. Absolutely right. Well, so here's the key takeaway. It's happening one of these days. It's going to be awesome. The cars are fun to drive. It's a lifestyle choice. Go buy a BMW. Uh, not 
because he's not allowed to say that, so I'll say it, um, or anything else you like. Um, and electric cars are a thing, yes? Electric cars are a thing. With that, I'm going to thank you all very much and tell you that DLD is awesome. I'm Shelley Palmer. That's Alex Cottage. We'll see you next time.